Okay, picking out where I left off. Um, in the last video, I left off with this statement. That is, the notion of blood as responsibility for someone's death leads us to an important direction. Leads us in, a, in an important direction. Execution of a criminal was legally self-caused. Second Samuel, chapter one, verse fourteen says, "Then David said to him, How is it that you are not afraid to stretch out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed?" And David called one of the young men and said, Go cut him down. So he struck him and he died. And David said to him, Your blood is, in, is on your head, for your mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. In this situation we have David, the new king, telling a young man to execute the slayer, the slayer of Saul. But the responsibility for the death of the slayer is on himself, not on David, nor the executioner. In a, in a, in an accountability sense, the slayer is responsible for his own death. He killed himself. If this principle is applied to the Amalekites, then they are responsible for their own deaths, even at the hands of the Israelite soldiers. The blood principle also has a visible component, the social recognition of responsibility for the crime. In the killing, in, in the wanton killing of a military general, for example, we see this can, this can apply to descendants. Uh, Take a look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 31 through 34. Notice that only Joab was executed. His family had had to deal with the, same, the shame and disgrace of Joab's crime. They are not guilty per se, but they are recipients of the consequence of Joab's guilt. Um, we have seen this even in the pre-agreed upon condition of execution. Read 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 36 through 38. In this case, we have Solomon pre-announcing the conditions under which Shemai would be executed and Shemai agreed. In this case, failure to keep the agreement with the authorities were accepted by both parties as a legitimate reason for execution. Shemai agreed that his blood would be upon his head, not Solomon's executioner. Again, he legally killed himself by going back on his agreement. Itself a gracious concession by a royal family, by the way. Again, death as execution is not the responsibility of the judge or executioner. It is on the criminal. Read Ezekiel 18.10. In Ezekiel, the person who oppresses others will be put to death, but his blood will be upon his own head. His own head. In other words, the death is not the responsibility of the judge or executioner. This blood responsibility also shows up in non-family relations in which one person could probably prevent the death of another. Notice how this would, would implicate the father in the death of his family. If he knew to flee perhaps from another from other encounters with Israel or just in general from their reputation at the time, then his failure to do so would have brought the blood of his family upon himself. He would have, it would have been he who killed his family and himself regardless of who, who the actual executioner was. What this basically means is that the father would have been actually responsible for the death of his family by his continued hostile actions towards the Israelites. The children were not punished for the crimes of the father, rather they were victims of the crimes of the father. A striking illustration of this and an additional indication that genocide is not the issue here comes from the incidental data in the passage from 2 Samuel chapter 1 we noted above. Then David took hold of his clothes and tore them. And also he did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and his son Jonathan for the people of the Lord in the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. In other words, this is, this is dealing with the death of King Saul and his son. And David said to the young man who told him, Where are you from? And he said, I am the son of an alien, an Amalekite. Then David said to him, How is it that you are not afraid to stretch out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of his young men and said, Go cut him down. So he struck him and he died. And David said to him, Your blood is on your head, for your mouth has testified against you. I have killed the Lord's anointed. Think about the implications of this passage for a second. The young man here is a child of an Amalekite immigrant to Israel. Israel allowed Amalekites to become part of the community in the category of resident alien. This child of an Amalekite was legally a full-blooded Amalekite. The Amalekite was trusted enough to serve in the, the army of Saul. Aliens were actually culturally integrated well enough into Israel to be expected to know the rulers about killing those anointed of, of Yahweh. This man was executed by David, not for being an Amalekite, but just another Israelite who had been in the same way for the same offense. Any other family members of the young man's father, an extended family probably, 
would not have suffered any harm in the attack on Amalek because their father had good sense to immigrate to Israel. David does not seem shocked to find an Amalekite among the troops resident in Israel, and this would likely imply that the others had immigrated as well. The widow for the Amalekites to migrate to Israel would have lasted approximately two to four hundred years after the pronunciation of destroy them etiquette etic in uh, Exodus chapter 17. So, <clears throat> here is a family where the father's wi wisdom saved the lives of his descendants. The offspring were spared from the destruction not because of their innocence or their guilt, but solely as a consequence of the father's actions. To, to net this out, the family members were not being punished for the sins of the father, but rather suffered the, suffered the consequences of the father's actions for good or ill. This, of course, is no different in principle today. The children of substance abusers don't, don't often experience the material benefits of others, or the material benefits are spent on alcohol or drugs. The children of physically abusive parents suffer bodily or psychological harm. The children of violent criminals offer, often end up father, fatherless. They suffer the consequences of the parents' sins and they are the victims solely of the parents. Okay, another question that pops up. But why couldn't the Israelites just ignore the Amalekites? Because the Amalekites wouldn't ignore Israel and, res and responsible Israelite parents would need to do something to protect their lives. The Amalekites were a cruel, active, and hostile force on Israelites' immediate border. Israel was forbidden to attack other border kingdoms by God, but Amalek had been actively oppressing Israel for about a, for at least 200 plus years, maybe 400 years, without provocation, beginning with their first week of freedom from Egypt to the more recent slave capture, pillage, and scorched earth aggressions in the books of Judges. The only act of suffering at this point was by Amalek on Israel. In spite of all the reason, Amalek continued to destroy land, people, crops, cattle, and to haul off people from for sale as slaves in, in foreign markets. People who had who 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 had only now gotten their first taste of freedom. This is not your normal angry neighbor. These are terrorists. These are slave traders. These are vandals. These are the unreasonable aggressors. Unlike the Canaanites who mostly migrated away, or the Jezebites who resorted to deception, for Israel ever to enjoy a moment's peace in the land of promise, Amalek must be rendered non-hostile. Without some kind of self-defense action on the port of Israel, Amalek would simply continue to inflict active suffering on Israel's families, their food, their freedom. Something had to be done. Somehow Amalek must be stopped. How could this have been done? These were nomadic, desert, uh, traveling peoples or tribes. They, if they had been settled, been a settled people like the Canaanites, you could simply have driven them out of their country and then occupy their cities, defend, defending them if and when they tried to retake the cities. But as a nomadic people only built, only built city, cities for religious shrine reasons or for their sacrifices, which often included child sacrifice, and were not there frequently or very long, this tactic would simply not work. These nomadic tribes, you either destroy their leadership and warriors or you, drop, you, you drove them out of their territory and built fornications around the, the edges of the land, keeping a military force along the barrier. If you're a fledgling, fledgling nation yourself, um, and pre-monarchy uh, Israel would have been, you would not have had remotely had enough adequate resources to build fortresses and provide a military force to guard against some de desert line fornications around a territory that was not given to you and your land by, by God anyway. This historically has rarely been an option for smaller states and territories without natural borders such as mountains or difficult rivers. In the face of unreasonable, consistent, and oppressive violence against your family and your kin, you are stuck with the imperative and responsibility for serious war. It is naive at best and, and morally irresponsible at worst to deny this. Defend one's family against unprovoked and destructive violence is a fundamental moral obligation. I hope it is clear by now that this is not some simple act of territorial aggression on the part of ancient Israel. This was defensive. This was a defensive military campaign. There's just there's there there just was not many practical options as to how to do this. And I'll pick up in the next